Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm so glad you could be with us here this morning, and I hope you've been able to get outside, maybe walk around your yard or take a little stroll, or just even crack open a window and enjoy some of that fresh spring air. If not, make sure you do this week. It is just such an amazing thing how it, it just really helps your attitude and your, and your spirits. Well, you know, we've been walking through a series over the last several weeks on the, the last days of Jesus Christ, our risen King. We've been looking into his crucifixion, his death, his resurrection, and into his ascension. And today we're going to wrap up this series with some of his very last words before he returned to heaven. Famous last words. You've heard that phrase before, right? Not everyone knows at what moment they're going to step from this life into eternity. And oftentimes those words that people say at that moment reflect what they've been thinking about or what they think about the most. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci's last words were, I have offended God and mankind because my work did not reach the quality it should have. Yeah, this is the guy who painted the Mona Lisa and uh, crafted numerous other masterpieces and inventions for our planet. Harriet Tubman, the lady who uh, freed many slaves back in the day, um, simply gathered her family around her and they sang together. And her last words were simply, swing low, sweet chariot. The owner of the Uh, The Hilton hotel chain, Conrad Hilton, when asked if he had any final words of wisdom, replied with these words, leave the shower curtain on the inside of the tub. Yeah, I'll let you think about that one for a little bit. But famous last words, right? Jesus knew exactly when he was going to leave the earth and return to heaven. So he chose very carefully what his last words were going to be. Please join me in prayer as we begin this morning. Heavenly Father, we just want to invite you to come this morning. Fill the places where we are gathering with your presence and fill our hearts and minds with the truth from your heart and mind as we examine your scriptures today. Amen. Well, we are keeping it really simple this morning, folks. Our focus text is just three verses long. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Some of the famous last words of Jesus before he returned to heaven in bodily form. Here at Countryside, these three verses are a part of what we call our purpose, our everyday mission, because these three verses are right out of Jesus' great commission, his great assignment, if you will, for all of his followers. Here's a little background. After his resurrection, Jesus appeared to his disciples over a period of 40 days, giving them some last instructions and also a number of convincing proofs that he was alive. And at the same time, indirectly, I'm sure he was giving the religious leaders of the day and the Roman authorities a whole bunch of headaches as they scrambled to try to figure out what was going on and what to do with this resurrected Christ. At the end of that time, Jesus met with his disciples on a mountain in Galilee where he told them these words from Matthew 28. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Famous last words. All right, let's break it down. First of all, Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I don't know about you, but I have glossed over that line of scriptures more time than I care to count. We all understand the concept of authority, right? At least to a degree. The online dictionary defines authority as the power or right to give orders, make decisions, and enforce obedience. We get that. We've had to live and operate with certain levels of authority for our entire lives. Now, good news is we all have some degree of authority over our our own lives, Now, it's probably a lot less than we realize or a lot less than we like, but still some degree nonetheless. And then we have a number of authorities over us, right? Parents, civic leaders, law enforcement, government. And if we're being totally honest, we'd probably all like those authorities to have a little less control over our lives than they do. But in our day-to-day lives, the levels of authority can often get a little fuzzy. There are There may be several that share some degree of authority over us when it comes to giving direction or making decisions or enforcing that obedience. So it can be a little confusing to discern where one authority's responsibility stops and the next one starts. I think it's a little bit clearer, though, when you look at our military. 
at least as I understand it, in the military, there is a very defined chain of command. So let's say you've got people A, B, and C, right? Person C receives their order from person B, and that person receives their order from person A. And again, if I understand correctly, person A would not normally give a direct order to person C, nor would person C go directly to person A for clarification or for other direction. Those would be examples of what they, what they call breaking the chain of command. In our country, there's one person over each different branch of the military. So nine people all together who form our joint chiefs of staff. Together, they oversee about 1.3 million soldiers in our various uh, branches of the military. And by our constitution, our president is the commander in chief or the commander over all those joint chiefs of, sa of staff. So from a military perspective, the president has authority over all of the branches of the military. And of course, we know that in addition to that, like it or not, our president has lots of other authority over our country as well. The power or right to give orders, make decisions, and enforce obedience. So make no mistake, whoever is serving as the president of the United States has a lot of authority over the lives of the people within the country. Which makes Jesus' statement here even more impactful. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I think we can probably all agree that true authority can only be given by those who hold authority. So if Jesus says that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him, then that statement can only be true if the one who was holding that power had given it to Jesus. In John chapter 1, the apostle John tells us that in the beginning was the word, who we know is Jesus. And the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. So long story short, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit made everything that exists. And so they automatically have authority over it all. That is why Jesus can make this statement. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I got to tell you, I don't know what that looked like. You know, maybe the three figures of the Trinity, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit all looked at each other. Or maybe they looked in the mirror, you know, and looked at themselves and said, I give you all authority in heaven and on earth. But God had, has, and always will have absolute authority over all creation. And in this moment here, it was Jesus who was making this statement. So why is this important? This is, this is important. In fact, it's critical for what Jesus says next. He's about to give his followers a very specific final command, those, those last words. And if the one who holds all authority in heaven and on earth tells you to do something, not only should you probably listen really, really close, but you probably better make sure that you go out and do it. Here's what Jesus said next. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So let's go back and break that down now into four parts. First of all, Jesus said, go. Now, this is one of those extremely complicated and complex thoughts in the Bible that we have to mull over and ponder for a really long time because I'm pretty sure that in the original language, this word go really means go. Okay, I'm kidding, right? It's not that complicated. But what did Jesus mean by it? I, I think that Jesus meant for his disciples to go, right? To go from the place where they were standing. They were on this mountaintop to go back down from the mountaintop into the city and then to go from the places where they had been gathering like the upper room and to go out from that into the rest of the city and then to go from that city back into the towns where they had come from and then to go from those places out into the world where the rest of the nations moved and lived and breathed. Jesus said, go. I don't think Jesus ever intended his disciples to stay all in one place from this moment until he returned, doing nothing but sitting on, his hand, on their hands until somebody happened to come by. No, that's not the model that Jesus showed us in the Gospels, in his life, in the scriptures, while he was with them. Rather, he showed us what going looks like. 
And I think that this has become one of the great challenges of our modern age. Either we don't have enough examples of people going around us, or we've closed our eyes and our ears to those who are going because, well, we're content to stay right here, to keep our faith right here, you know, in my own heart, right? In my own home, in my own church, in my own seat. Now, I will grant you that in today's challenges, we have a few more hurdles and obstacles as far as going goes, right? Um, We've been told to stay home and stay safe. But even so, there are still many ways that we can be going, if not physically, then through other means, right? I mean, we've got phone calls. We can, we can send out cards. We can text. We can tweet. We can Facebook. We can Instagram. We can Snapchat. We can email. We can Zoom. There are so many possibilities before us today. We can still connect with people. And if we're going to fulfill Jesus' command to get to all nations, then we're going to have to get outside of our comfort zones and get to know some people that we didn't know before, some people from other backgrounds and other cultures that we don't normally rub shoulders with. Maybe that means, you know, we have to uh, learn who our neighbors are. Maybe that means we have to look up some of those places where we can connect with a child in a third world country and and start to sponsor them and get to know them and, and write letters back and forth like a pen pal. There are lots of possibilities. So, but Jesus said, first of all, go. And then he said, make disciples of all nations. So how does one make a disciple? I mean, is it like making a cake? I mean, you take one Galilean fisherman, add three years of miracles and scripture discussions and personal interactions, prayer, and throw in a few difficulties, and then douse the whole thing with an ample portion of the Holy Spirit and mix it all up and then pour it out into the world. Now, I don't think that's exactly what Jesus had in mind. It's a little bit, kind of, sort of, but not exactly, right? What is this disciple making? How is it done? What did Jesus do? If we look at Jesus' example across the Gospels, we will see that his approach to disciple-making was, first of all, intentional. All right, It wasn't an accident. He went where the people were, and he did so on purpose. Secondly, it was extended. It wasn't a one-time, one-event kind of thing. He spent his time with his disciples. Most of them were with Jesus for three years. His training with them was also thorough. Jesus taught them through messages and parables, through the scripture, through example. They watched as he interacted with other people and performed miracles and healed people. And he also taught them by doing, giving them assignments to complete and then having them come back together and share the results with everyone, with the whole class, right? His training was also God-focused. Making disciples has to be God-focused training with an emphasis constantly on who God is, who Jesus is, and how we come to him. And finally, Jesus' process also had the goal of producing more disciples. Jesus wasn't looking for a holy huddle of a dozen disciples. He was looking for men and women who would take up the cross, follow his example, share God's love with the world, and then multiply that across the planet. So Jesus was telling his disciples to go, to make disciples of all nations, and thirdly, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, we know what baptism is all about, right? I mean, we know that it is something that people are supposed to do as followers of Christ. But what do we really know about it? Our our practice of baptizing followers of Christ actually has roots to go all the way back to Moses. God gave Moses directions for several situations in which people were to be cleansed from various conditions by washing with water. So it was both a practical thing and also a spiritual obedience thing. And then along comes John the Baptist. Here are the opening words of the Gospel of Mark, um, speaking of John the Baptist. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. Okay, here comes the part about John the Baptist. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness 
preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. So John was sent to clear the way for Jesus and prepare people's hearts for his coming with baptism and repentance. So repentance is turning away from sin and back to God. It's a beautiful thing that takes place within our heart and soul. Baptism, then, is the external expression of that inner work that is happening, that's going on. So it's symbolic of what's going on on the inside. Baptism is also about following Jesus' command. Right here, the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19, he said, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So that's, that's a part of what baptism is about. It's also about identifying with Jesus. Not only is baptism symbolic of the repentance and the cleansing that's going on on the inside, but it's also symbolic of identifying with Christ as we are going under the water in immersion and then being raised back up like Christ was, de- was dead, was put to death, put in the grave, and then was resurrected again to new life. So also, it's a picture of us dying to our old way of life and being resurrected to a new life in Christ. It's a special moment in the life of the believer in which he or she proclaims to the world through this act, I am now a follower of Christ. I am putting to death my old life and starting brand new. Right now, for those of us living here in the United States, baptism is a very special occasion where a person usually is surrounded by their church, their family and friends. And we'll get back there someday, hang in there. But in in other parts of the world, right now, the act of being baptized can be a death sentence, literally. There are other parts of the world where Christianity is not tolerated, and anyone who is baptized in the name of Christ is in danger of being turned over by their own families to the authorities or to some radical group who will then put them to death. And yet, even so, people are coming to Jesus by the thousands, threat or no threat. So, The fourth part of Jesus' great commission, those those famous last words, he said, teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. Now, Jesus taught a lot of things. And we have four gospels committed to his life on earth and his teaching and dozens, if not hundreds of different things that Jesus commanded his followers to do. So how in the world are we supposed to teach anyone all of that? Well, remember that Jesus took a full three years as he was walking through this life, teaching his disciples, right? So we're probably not going to cover everything that he had to teach, had to share with them in a four to six week class. And there's no way that I'm going to cover it all here in the next four to six minutes with you. But I can give you a, a head start really quick, all right? When asked what the greatest of all the commandments is, Jesus responded with this, these words in Matthew 22. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Most of us could probably spend the rest of our lives trying to live out those two commandments right there and do them to the best of our abilities, right? Seriously, those two things, to do them right, require prayer, self-discipline, selflessness, and a serious level of commitment. Don't forget the great commission that we're talking about uh, this morning. Therefore, go and make disciples. That would be a great lesson three of Jesus' lessons to his followers, right? Right after love God and love people. I gotta tell you, folks, that some people have bought into the lie that a person has to have a, a ministry degree or graduate from some seminary in order to start making disciples or start teaching people the things that Jesus taught us, but that's just a lie. I mean, I have seen children who are some of the most effective evangelists on the planet. Why? Because they love God, they know that God loves them, and they want to share that love with other people. That's a start, and it's a great start. And if you're a follower of Jesus, then you already have a key component for making other disciples and teaching them what Jesus taught. And that component is your story how and when you became a Christian, a follower of Christ. Do you remember that time? I know for a lot of us, we probably know 
the time, the place, exactly what was going on, maybe even what we were wearing when we had that special moment when we came to Christ for the very first time. That's your story, your story in Christ. And it's a powerful part of God's plan for redemption on this earth. And he wants you to share it. And as you're sharing it, learn the next lesson and then share that lesson and then learn the next one and share it and learn the next and share it. And that's how disciple making works. We learn something about Christ and about life in Christ and we share it. And we continue to do that throughout our lives. Well, Jesus wraps up these famous last words of his with a very important statement that's also a promise. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, I know at first that sounds just like some sentimental statement, right? I mean, we've seen a lot of movies. We've seen where the hero in the movie goes off the scene for the very last time. And as they're, they're going, they look back and they say one of those classic lines like, I'll be with you always right here, right? But Jesus wasn't saying that he would be just a clear memory, or that he would be a a strong emotion in their hearts. No, in this, in the same scene told in the book of Acts, Jesus said this, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father has promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then a few verses later, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. See, the disciples didn't know it yet, but they were about to find out how Jesus was going to be with them forever in the form of the Holy Spirit. Not only would they be consoled in his absence, but guess what? We too would be consoled in absence of Jesus by the Holy Spirit. Not only would his first disciples be empowered, but we too would be empowered by the Holy Spirit to live out and to fulfill his famous last words. And again, those last words from Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. And these are gonna be our memory verse, folks, for the month of May. Check it out. They say, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Let's pray. Father God, we are so thankful for this passage of scripture, famous last words of Jesus, the words that he left with his disciples on that mountainside and left with us for always, God, in your word, in the scriptures, in, this, in these accounts. And we're so thankful. And they give us purpose. They give us direction. And God, I would pray that you would help each of us to learn how to live out these directions from our Lord in the days ahead. God, show us what it means to go. Show us what it means to make disciples. Show us what it means to baptize them in your name. God, show us what it means to teach them what Jesus taught to us. Help us to live it out, God, forevermore, we pray in your precious name. Amen. Well, hey, next week, we are going to begin a new series on some of those tough questions that people ask about the Bible. Questions like, does the Big Bang fit with the Bible? Or, how old is the earth? And even, what does the Bible say about dinosaurs? So get ready for those tough questions coming up in the next several weeks. Also, make sure you check out our follow-up questions for today's message here on our Facebook page and take this message to the next level with your family and friends. God bless you, everyone. Have a wonderful week.